you very much. Thank you all for coming. My name is Graham Montague, and this is being co-authored by Dr. Dan Schaup. And we will be presenting on the advances from two decades of flathead catfish research, how far have we come since Catfish 2000. First, I would like to thank the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management at Oklahoma State University for making this presentation possible. So channel catfish, blue catfish, and flathead catfish are all popular sport fish uh, throughout the United States and have uh, a particular interest amongst anglers because of their ability to grow to large sizes. Um, however, there's been little research conducted on these sport fish relative to other sport fish in North America. So we had our first international ichthylurid symposium uh, looking at catfish research called Catfish 2000. Um, in that symposium, Jackson wrote a paper titled Flathead Catfish, Biology, Fisheries, and Management that highlighted all of the research that's been conducted on flathead catfish up to the year 2000. We had another international symposium, Catfish 2010, and now here we are, Catfish 2020. And our goal of this paper and presentation is really to summarize the literature that has been conducted on flathead catfish in the last 20 years. And really we wanna point out the advancements that we've made and the research gaps that we still need to research on this understudied fish species. So the way that we collected our literature, we used the search engine Google Scholar with the search all in the title, flathead catfish or Philodictus olivaris. Philodictus olivaris is the scientific name of flathead catfish. And we looked at all the peer reviewed literature. We found 82 papers in 24 journals, and you could see eight papers came from Catfish 2000. Um, there was another increase in literature in the year 2005, but then for Catfish 2010, we had the highest uh, number of papers with 19 from Catfish 2010. And in 2020, I looked through the abstracts and 16 presentation matched our search criteria. So there is another increase in flathead catfish research. Uh, if we look at the journals where these papers are being published, uh, North American Journal of Fisheries Management published 19 of these, and then Catfish 2010, Catfish 2000 uh, rounded out the top three with uh, 18 and eight papers. So from the 82 papers that we did find, we split them up into two main topics. Uh, the biology and ecology of flathead catfish and the fisheries management of flathead catfish. From the biology and ecology, we split them up into subgroupings of habitat and the environment, diet and movements, and that's what we'll talk about first. So we found 11 papers that looked at the habitat and the environment of flathead catfish. Flathead catfish prefer free-flowing, unimpounded rivers, um, and in the summer, they're usually found in water depths below three meters. And in the winter, they'll move to water depths um, that are deeper than uh, four meters uh, deep. They like rocky shoreline with riprap and large woody debris, and also prefer substrates with hard bottom. Urbaniz urbanization also plays an impact on flathead catfish habitat. Flathead catfish grow faster in areas of mature riparian zone, and also have, but also have higher relative abundance in areas with um, land agricultural use. Juvenile flathead catfish are found in riffles of streams and they uh, select micro habitat based on their body size. Uh, they'll generally uh, reach an ontogenetic shift from eating macroinvertebrates and crayfish to eating more piscine prey when they reach above 300 millimeters in length. So 14 papers have looked at the diet of flathead catfish um, flathead catfish are generalists. Uh, they eat a wide variety of food items, ranging from crayfish, shad, centrarchids, maronids, um, and other fish species. They're also opportunistic, meaning that they'll feed proportional um, to the uh, prey availability, availability in a system. Uh, they're one of the least gape-limited predators, um, and they also establish themselves as an apex predator in the system where they reside. Temperature has an impact on their feeding. They decrease their feeding when temperatures reach below 15 degrees Celsius and stop feeding altogether when the water temperature drops below seven degrees Celsius. 12 papers have looked at the movement of flathead catfish. 
On a diurnal cycle, they're generally sedentary during the day when at night they'll be highly mobile, um, cruising the shorelines and foraging for food. They also undergo, um, on an annual cycle, three distinct migration periods. Uh, they go from their overwintering habitats to their pre-spawn summer habitats when the water temperature uh, increases to about 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. And then from their pre-spawn summer habitats, they'll move to their late summer and fall habitats when the water temperature decreases to around 20 to 15 degrees Celsius. From their late summer and fall habitats, they'll move back to their overwintering habitats when the water temperature decreases um, below 14 degrees Celsius. In the winter, they move very little. They'll kind of uh, almost hibernate in deep holes. And, but on an annual cycle, they are highly dispersal, um, especially in rivers where they've been shown to migrate uh, long distances. However, it's important to note that not all individuals in the population undergo these high uh, migrations. Five other papers have looked at uh, some miscellaneous topics, uh, the microorganisms found on flathead catfish, the world record flathead catfish uh, caught in Elk City Reservoir in Kansas, and also a genetics paper that looked at flathead uh, catfish genetics. So if we look at the fisheries management side, the subgroupings that we grouped uh, the papers are in are age and growth, sampling, uh, mortality and exploitation, harvest management, and introduced populations. 12 papers have looked at flathead catfish age and growth. Otoliths are thought to be uh, the most accurate and precise aging structure, um, and they have been used to age fish up to 34 years. Uh, pectoral spines are also used to uh, age flathead catfish, but has been, have been noted to underage older size fish or, or, or older fish. Uh, when using pectoral spines, um, the basal resex section is uh, preferred over the articulating process uh, because it is easier to read. Flathead catfish grow fastest in areas where they are introduced. Um, over uh, rivers that are where they are native and also they grow faster in reservoirs in their native range over uh, rivers in their native range. Also there is no difference between growth uh, amongst sexes so males and females grow at relatively the same growth rate. 14 papers have looked at the sampling of flathead catfish populations Low frequency electrofishing is the most efficient and um, has the highest catch rates with up to 62 fish per hour. Uh, low frequency electrofishing is electrofishing that uses less, less than 30 pulses per second. Um, 15 pulses per second is found to be the most effective um, pulses per second. Chase boats are used in lodic environments, uh, but have not been shown to increase the capture efficiency of uh, low frequency electrofishing on flathead catfish populations in lentic environments. Hoop nets are set when the water temperature is in the spawning season uh, for flathead catfish. Uh, trot lines can be set with cut bait or live bait to um, sample flathead catfish populations also. Other gears such as high frequency electrofishing, gill nets and rod and reel have been used to uh, sample flathead catfish, but they're not as efficient as low frequency electrofishing. The accuracy and the precision of these gears are still unknown. No one has ever quantified the biases towards these gear. Anecdotally, uh, it is thought that low frequency electrofishing is size biased uh, against fish uh, above 600 millimeters. So, it is thought that low frequency electrofishing doesn't um, sample proportional to the population, especially those larger size classes. Uh, to really assess that size bias uh, and look at the accuracy and the precision of the gear, you need to create a known population with a known size structure and a known abundance. And to do that, you need to tag a lot of fish um, to create those known populations. So the tagging methods that have most been used is the Carlin Dangler tags and the pit tags with pit tags having the highest retention uh, with up to 99% over a year long in the dorsal musculature of these fish. 15 papers have looked at the mortality and exploitation of flathead catfish populations. In introduced rivers, the mortality rate ranges from 0.16 to 0.37, with the exception of some rivers that range up to 0.6. 
In native rivers, uh, the mortality rate ranges from 0.14 to 0.33. In reservoirs, the mortality rate ranges from 0.11 to 0.40. Exploitation rates range uh, in reservoirs anywhere from 0 to 13%. So these fish are typically lightly exploited and have low mortality rates, pretty typical of a large uh, fish, especially as the apex predator flathead catfish. <coughs> Five papers have looked at the harvest management of flathead catfish. Uh, anglers and managers prefer, prefer trophy size fish over the quantity of fish caught. Um, and there are also many anglers that are harvest oriented, uh, meaning that they want to uh, eat the fish that they keep. Um, and then also noodling has thought to be unsustainable um, and can be a detrimental uh, way of harvest in, where it is legal. But in the two papers that looked at noodling, um, it can be a sustainable form of harvest where it is legal. Also the use of models can help managers uh, regulate the populations and manage their populations um, in both lodic and lenic environments. 20 papers have looked at the introduced populations of flathead catfish. Um, flathead catfish uh, are highly dispersal and they could live in high salt, so 11, 11 parts per thousand salt, which is characteristic of estuarine habitat. So they have invaded, especially along the Atlantic coast, um, where they're having detrimental effects uh, to the native fish assemblages along the Atlantic coast and the rivers. Um, and they're out competing a lot of those native fish assemblages. There are management strategies to reduce the biomass and reduce the population size of these fish. Low frequency electrofishing removals uh, have been implemented and have been shown to be an effective way uh, to reduce these, these fish and reduce the biomass where they are introduced. So in conclusion, uh, we learned that Flathead catfish are highly dispersal. Um, they are generalists and they can establish themselves as an apex predator. And also in their introduced populations, they uh, can be detrimental to a lot of the native fish assemblages uh, found, found in those rivers where they are uh, introduced. Future research should focus on spawning and reproduction. Since 2000, no papers have looked at the spawning and reproduction of this fish that we know of. Um, many management state agencies still do not have a san standardized sampling protocol for sampling uh, flathead catfish, both in the lodic and lendic environments. And where they do, where they do, um, there's still discrepancies. Uh, the accuracy and the precision of these sampling gears is, is still unknown and needs to be quantified. Um, and then also, managers and anglers prefer trophy size fish, so additional trophy management strategies. Um, are important to be developed to give uh, managers examples on how we could better manage these uh, populations for trophy size fish. So really our goal was to summarize the literature for the last 20 years. Um, and hopefully this summer uh, summary kind of entices additional research on this un understudied fish um, because it is uh, definitely the least studied out of the three major ictalurid species. So with that, I'll Take any questions. Grant, great overview. I learned a lot about flatheads. There's been several Chesapeake presentations, and I think you know, um, and you indicated on one of your maps, um, that species has uh, found its way into the Chesapeake watershed. And as you noted, they have a preference and affinity for uh, rocky substrates. So they're more or less sequestered now in the, in the upper reaches of tributaries in the Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. My question to you, I'm curious, you, you notice in your five paper summary of harvest and you know, for management purposes, there seems to be a focus on recreational. Um, is, is there anything out there that you're aware of uh, related to commercial harvest management? I'm curious about that. Our commercial fishers are pretty effective at catching blue cats. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering about the, you know, how that would play out with flatheads. Yeah, I think there is a paper on modeling the commercial harvest of that. And uh, I think it has been 
I think it has been shown that commercial harvest does reduce, obviously, the, the population size. So it can be a, a way to reduce those populations, especially where they are introduced. So little regulation, well, no regulations on them and limited harvest and also with the commercial harvest can uh, reduce that biomass and reduce those fish in the system. Yep. Questions? Yeah, I just have a comment to kind of address where you were going. So our, our friends in Georgia who aren't here uh -huh. are making a concerted effort to remove flatheads and now blues from the satilla. Okay. They can't find anybody to take the fish flesh. Oh, really? At all. <laughs> I'll take them. <laughs> they're giving the blue, head, the blue cats to somebody, somebody's doing us something, so they're giving those fish away. They're not getting that many. Mm -hmm. But every Thursday, they haul all the coolers of frozen flatheads, and there are many, 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 many coolers. Really? They're filling up a huge dumpster, and so once a week, the landfill people come and take the fish they keep keeping in the cold house so that they don't stink to high heaven, so they can oh. sit out in the yard. Mm -hmm. And they've tried to find somebody to come and take them and turn them into fertilizer or cat food or something, and they have nowhere to prove Yeah. So I don't think there's a demand for it. I wonder, yeah, I wonder if, uh, I, yeah, and that's, yeah, I don't think a lot of people are really keeping a lot of fish anymore. Um, but I wonder if there's a way that you could like, donate that to like. They've been trying. Really? They've and food Really? Even when they're fresh that day. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. I guess it's location, location, location. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I'll take them, honestly. I'll, I'll go to George and I'll, I'll eat those all day. <laughs> okay, ship them, ship them to Oklahoma State. <laughs> and, and just a quick follow-up, so I really appreciate that comment. So the, our processors, uh, I think a lot of folks that are attending this conference know that the last iteration of the Farm Bill shifted a calori, or actually Saloriform is, uh, to USDA for inspection. So that, that limits the number of processors. So up in the Chesapeake, we have six or seven that can handle these fish to fry <coughs> or cut market. Mm -hmm. To your point, um, one thing that they complained to us a couple of weeks ago, a bunch of us were at Virginia Commonwealth University at a conference, and they said the processors struggle to, to cut those fish. And I, I don't know exactly what the reason is, but it sounds like it's, it's playing into the, some of the scenarios you're, you're indicating. Um, so they're, they're, they, they cut blue cats to the cows come home, but they, they really struggle with flatheads for some reason. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, one quick question. Mm -hmm. When you look at the introduction of the Omega Brain to the uh -huh. Basin, in your research, what was the primary vector for those introductions? Oh, uh, um, I think there was a couple of just anglers putting them in the system. Um, so then anglers put a couple of fish in the system and they're able to disperse from that. Um, I can't remember if that was in, in Georgia or not, but... I think anglers are. I think anglers are, are putting them in the system, and then they kind of spread from there. That's what happened to Mr. Tiller. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I think I remember reading that paper. Mm -hmm. Yep. But they are highly dispersal, so they they are, they have the ability to travel um, long distances. So they do they they do have the ability to to move once they are introduced in a, in a spot. Yeah. I might have missed it. Did you have anything, has there been any research done on, I know in Iowa we have issues with mercury content in some of the larger flatheads? Yeah, like the bioaccumulation. Right, is that something? No, no, no one's ever looked at that. I, have, I suspect it's probably crazy high, um, but no, none of the published literature has looked at any of the mercury content. Be interesting, though. Any other questions? Thank you, Brian. Yep, thank you.